tonight has a very Gallic flavor, I think. Uh, we're doing this to, to, uh, in collaboration with La Sorbonne, uh, where uh, Professor Villani spoke yesterday. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to welcome uh, the French contingent in the crowd, bienvenue. Merci uh, Khaid, everybody. Um, it's always, a, as I always say, a delight to see so many people in the audience. But let me say uh, a word or two about our speaker, Cédric Villani, who was born in 73. He, he studied um, mathematics, dif uh, differential equations, at the uh, École Normale Supérieure in Paris, and then went on to complete his PhD at uh, Université de Paris at Dauphine. Uh, and since then, he's been teaching at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, at Lyon, I think, where you now have a up professorship. To, up to 2009, after okay. which I became professor at the University of Lyon. Mm, très bien. Okay. Uh, and in the meantime, he's won a, a, a enormous accolades for his work, uh, begun in his PhD, I think, on the Boltzmann equation. And in 2010, of course, he was awarded the Fields Prize for the work on the Boltzmann equation and uh, the issue of Landau damping, about which I know very little, I'm afraid. But <laughs> I'm sure we might hear a bit more about that this evening. Uh, uh, other notable awards which Professor Villani has received are the Albron Prize, the EMS Prize, the Fermat Prize, and the Henri Poincaré Prize. Henri Poincaré, of course, is a very famous name in Paris, uh, uh, reference. He is also the director of the Institut Poincaré since 2009, uh, as well as the many other things he does. He's authored two, two uh, textbooks on top topics in optimal transportation and is on the editorial boards of, 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 of too many boards to list, in fact. I think I want, I want you to, to, to have the podium. So um, it, it's a great honor to have you here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause to our speaker, so today, tonight, it's going to be a lecture about a number of subjects related to mathematics. There will be some unity which may not necessarily be apparent. Before, not necessarily be apparent at first sight, but then, by the end of the talk, you will all understand where the unity comes from. Let me um, take this opportunity, since this is NYU Abu Dhabi, to briefly evoke my first encounter with NYU, with the uh, Courant Institute of Mathematics in New York. This was in uh, 1999, so I was 26 years old, and I was uh, going to visit uh, Hong Tse Yao, now in Harvard. And uh, this was uh, very impressive for me to meet a place which had been so important for the development of applied mathematics, including the Boltzmann equation with the works of Harold Grad after the Second World War, including uh, uh, Varadhan, uh, Raghu Varadhan, who has been one of the leading probabilists and specialists of particle physics, and was since then awarded the Abel Prize. Now, let's start our journey with a picture illustrating some poetry. Why not? This is a picture taken, this is an illustration of the poem The Lady of Charlotte by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Maybe some of you in the audience know this piece, which is, uh, which is famous in the English literature repertoire. In this uh, poem, Tennyson talks about some mysterious lady who is imprisoned in some kind of castle and uh, condemned by some magical curse to only see the world through the reflection of some mirror. So, in the tale, this is a tragedy, you know, at some point arrives uh, Lancelot, you see him in his reflection here in the mirror, and Lancelot is so handsome that she cannot uh, help looking at him directly through the window, and then she is struck by the, the curse and she dies and so on. 
and her body drifts on the water. It's a very tragic tale. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's famous, and then there are many interpretations of this work and what to think about it. And because the author did not say exactly what he means by this, we can always imagine that this is an allegory for the mathematician. She is the mathematician here. She is condemned by a curse to explore the world only through the abstract reflection of the abstract formulas. Contrary to a physicist who can directly make experiments and ask questions to nature, the mathematician can only ask questions in the reflection, which are the mathematical equations reflecting the outside world. This is one of the first things that it is important to emphasize about mathematics, that it is reflection of the world, abstract as it seems. And you know here, for instance, the river here on which the Lady of Charlotte will drift when she dies, you can uh, see it just by feeling or by representing it or by analogy, but you can also represent it by a mathematical equation. At first sight, it will not look very appealing, like this Euler equation here. But for some applications and some, to, uh, some goals, it may be extremely important. Now, this is one first thing that it's important to emphasize about mathematics, reflection of the world. Second thing that it is important to emphasize about mathematics, it is a modern subject which is always evolving and which has, it counts more followers nowadays, I mean more mathematicians alive, than the total number of mathematicians who ever existed before. Which means that it is increasing rapidly. And this world needs mathematicians more and more as time passes. Because mathematics is more and more useful, more and more applied and used in our lives. It plays an active role in our daily life, it plays an active role in the economy, it plays an active role everywhere. It is evolving and also as a consequence there are many, many theorems which are proven every year, like hundreds of thousands. And uh, at the same time as these problems are solved, new problems arise, so the number of open problems also goes increasing and increasing. It's a never-ending process. Of course, if there are problems that are solved, it means that there are also problems which are unsolved. And as a matter of fact, all mathematicians know that there are many, many such problems. If you ask mathematicians which is the most important problem to solve, they will have various answers depending on their tastes and their background. Some will say it's a problem about mathematics and biology. Some will talk about fluid mechanics. They will not agree about which is the most important. But if you ask them which is the most famous problem in mathematics, they will all agree. The Riemann hypothesis. This is the most famous problem uh, currently. And it has been so, so almost since it was formulated in the middle of the 19th century. This is Bernard Riemann, one of the most fascinating mathematicians who ever walked on this planet. His hypothesis is very simple to state. If you are a university student just after a, a couple of years, it can be understood. And even if you are just know what complex numbers are, you can get a hint about it. It's about a certain function, the Riemann zeta function. If the parameter is s, then you make the sum of all the inverse of the s powers of the integers. Like for s equals 2, this would be 1 plus 1 divided by 2 to the square, plus 1 divided by 3 to the square, etc. And this zeta function, there is a way to define it whenever s is a complex number with a real part and an imaginary part, so that you have a function depending on two real parameters like defined on the plane. And this function, you ask, when does it vanish? Which are the solutions of the equation zeta of s equals zero? There are infinitely many solutions. For s is minus two, minus four, minus six, etc. 
there is a solution, but for many other values also which are not integers. Riemann conjectured that all these extra values would be lined up in the plane all on a single vertical line. Real part is equal to one half. So you may say, okay, if there is this conjecture, let us compute the solutions and see where they are. Ah, how do you compute them? Well, nowadays we can use computers to compute these approximate solutions. People have done this. And they have computed billions of solutions. Billions and billions and billions. And all these solutions, they were all lined on the real part equals one half line. All of them. And still, it is considered an open problem. This tells you something very distinctive about mathematics, maybe the main difference between mathematics and the rest. You see, in any field of science, or even in any field of knowledge, when you make an assumption and you see that it is satisfied every time, and you check a thousand times and it is true, or a million times and it is true, then you consider it's a fact, a law, it's true. If it is true a billion times of experiments, also we consider it true. But not in mathematics. Even if you have a billion positive experiments, the mathematician will not believe. He believes only when he sees a logical reasoning proving only by logical thinking that the answer is yes. The Riemann hypothesis, why do we care about it? First, because it's simple and difficult to prove and it has been resisting every effort since uh, a century and a half. Second, because it is related to the prime numbers and in the second formula here, P stands for prime numbers. If the Riemann hypothesis is true, it means that in a way, prime numbers are kind of randomly distributed among integers. Prime numbers are the elementary numbers which cannot be divided into smaller units, cannot be written as a product of smaller numbers. So the zeta function of Riemann and the Riemann hypothesis is related to some of the objects that fascinate people, that have fascinated, been fascinating them for thousands of years. A few years ago, the Guardian, trying to do mathematical outreach for general audience, had this idea that if the Riemann hypothesis is solved, it would bring disaster to the internet. Why on earth? Well, because it is related to prime numbers and their location, and because prime numbers for a long time were used as a way to make encryption for computers, system, for internet, for everything, because of the difficulty of factorizing a very, very large number. Of course, when you see this, if you understood what I said, you understand it is complete crap. Because uh, if uh, it's the Riemann hypothesis says that, pri that prime numbers are randomly distributed, where on earth will this be of any help to help you factorize a big number? If it is random, it will not make your life easier to find it. But maybe the journalists thought that with this connection to internet, it would make it more sensational, make the problem look more worthwhile. But mathematicians did not need this to be interested by the problem. First of all, prime numbers are not any longer the main method used for encryption. Second, they know that the uh, Riemann hypothesis is interesting, beautifully interesting, for all its consequence to pure mathematics and pure science. For instance, there is a connection between Riemann hypothesis and, uh, the, and quantum mechanics, abstract quantum mechanics in the sense of understanding the levels of energy of an abstract random atom. Very deep link that nobody understands. And there are other very deep links. And this is what makes the Riemann hypothesis a central object in mathematics. Actually, actually, there is a reward of $1 million for whoever proves the Riemann hypothesis. I tell you, there are many, many easier ways to win a $1 million. <laughs> and anyway, as, um, 
as the great mathematician Andrew Wise put, put it a few years ago, any decent mathematician would gladly give a million bucks to have the honor to prove the conjecture. Riemann did not only work on the Riemann hypothesis and number theory. He also made great work in geometry, and in particular, he gave us the basic axioms after which we do nowadays non-Euclidean geometry. So it is called Riemannian geometry in his honor. In the world of Riemannian geometry, uh, units of length may change from position to position. This here and this here may have different lengths. And the whole landscape may be curved, so that shortest paths are not straight lines, but they are curved. Take, for instance, the surface of the Earth, which is like a ball, of course. The shortest way to go from Paris to Abu Dhabi is not a straight line. It makes no sense. It's not a straight line on the map, either. It's some curved line which includes the fact that the Earth is curved. These paths are called geodesics, and they are the central object to do geometry in the non-Euclidean, non-fat, non-flat, sorry, world. Riemann also gave us the main object with which we understand it, curvature. Curvature, as defined by Riemann, gives us a way to measure, to understand the behavior of these geodesics by the speed at which they get further apart. If they get further apart from each other faster than they would if they were on the plane, then we see that the curvature is negative. And this will correspond to a geometry in which triangles will look skinny. If they tend to get closer, more close to each other than they would in the plane, then we see that the curvature is positive and the corresponding triangles will look fat. Take, for instance, this uh, hyperbolic geometry represented here by the artist M. C. Escher. In this geometry, which was a great discovery of the 19th century, each fish as represented here has the same length, just the units of length change depending on the position. And in this geometry, here are some geodesics lines and the triangle corresponding to it. Look how skinny. The sum of the angles, of course, is less than 180 degrees. On the contrary, in positive curvature, like on the surface on the sphere, the sum of the angles will be more than 180 degrees. Look here, three right angles makes 270 degrees. And this will always be the case for a triangle which is drawn in positive geometry. And look, remember I told you positive curvature corresponds to geodesics, getting further apart slower than in the plane. In fact, look at these two geodesics. At some point, they meet up there, and then they meet again down, South Pole, let's say. This is impossible in the plane. If two lines cross each other, they will never cross each other a second time. They will just get further apart and further apart. But in positive curvature, they are able to see each other again. So the distance is lower, smaller, than the corresponding distance for Euclidean space. This is a picture taken in, the, in Dublin, as we can guess from the color of the hair of this actress, in the Dublin Museum of Hyperbolic Coral Reef. There you see these beautiful shapes. Oops, look at this. This is a hyperbolic coral reef. It's a knitting with constant negative curvature, imitating coral reef, but a mathematical object, of course. This is another mathematical object with negative curvature. It was on display, it's called the pseudosphere. It was on display 
at the Fondation Cartier for Contemporary Art in Paris a couple of years ago. This is yet another object with negative curvature. Look at this here. It looks like it has been glued together many, many kind of horse saddles. A horse saddle is a typical example of surface with negative curvature. And here we see that these objects, so this is a picture from digital artists Palais and Benard. It represents some geometric figures arising in various problems of geometry of physics. And look at this important notion. This object here, this object there, and that object here are very different in shape. But they are all of the same nature to the eyes of a differential geometer, constant negative curvature objects. With the curvature of Riemann, you are able to classify such kind of objects and understand them. Curvature, as we see on these examples, makes beautiful, inspiring pictures and shapes. But it is also, curvature, a very useful concept. And the discovery of Riemann was taken and deepened by others, by people who followed him. Among them, in particular, Ricci Curbastro, an Italian differential geometer from the beginning of the 20th century, who devised the Ricci curvature as, let's say, a particular case of Freeman curvature. Later, shortly after Ricci made his contribution, Albert Einstein understood that the Ricci curvature was exactly the mathematical cornerstone that he needed for his theory of general relativity. And you see here how a concept which was first a concept of pure geometry, let's say abstract, became intimately linked to our very representation of space and time. If you wait one more century, then it becomes a familiar object. You know, GPS would not work if it did not take into account corrections related to general relativity. So, in a way, 150 years after the formulation of the Riemannian geometry, his curvature is now in our daily lives. We use it without knowing it. And within uh, any of these machines, there is a bit of Einstein, a bit of Ricci, and a bit of Riemann, as we can check by opening it. Riemann was interested also in understanding the shapes of the universe around him. For instance, why do singularities like this occur in the reflection, light reflection in your, in your cup of tea? Why do lines like this of discontinuity appear when there is a supersonic plane flying or when there is a, when a Kalashnikov fires a bullet. This was also something he was the first to try to put into mathematical equations, singularities of compressible fluid mechanics, shocks. In fact, Riemann was interested in everything. And it is very striking to compare the list of concepts which bear his name to the brevity of his life. He was dead at my age, basically. This tragic and beautiful destiny makes Riemann a very romantic figure in the story of mankind, very inspiring in science, but also beyond. Actually, once I met a famous rock singer who told me that she likes, from time to time, to go meditating over the grave of Riemann for the inspiration. This is an example of how mathematicians with their creative power can inspire artists. I recommend this activity, going on graves to meditate, and this is an example of me 
paying a visit to an old friend, Ludwig Boltzmann. Ludwig Boltzmann was a great Austrian scientist, the father of some of the most important concepts in physics. In particular, here you see on his grave the famous formula for the entropy. S is K log W, where W is the uncertainty when you observe a system. Logarithm, for those who have forgotten, is something like the number of digits of a number. K is a constant. So S in the Boltzmann picture is like the number of, uh, is like the size of a number that will describe your uncertainty when you observe a system. And this is usually interpreted as a notion of microscopic disorder. This picture was taken in the Central Cemetery of Vienna in 2006. When I was there in this cemetery, not having any idea of where Boltzmann was, but I knew he was someplace, I did not know where to go, and so I tried to ask people who were around and sitting on a bench. And uh, I asked if there were directions somewhere, and the guy told me, no, there is no map. Anyway, who are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for Boltzmann, thinking maybe he has heard about him. And the guy answered me exactly this, ah, S is K log W. So here you see how an important mathematical formula can become a kind of secret password in a grave in, uh, in cemeteries for people in the know. Now, what is it that is so important in this formula that people, just by evoking it, feel that there is a whole world uh, lying there? In the world of Boltzmann and Maxwell, around 1860-1870, a gas is described by a collection of tiny particles. Remember, at this time, the existence of atoms was not well established. It was a subject of controversy. So let us imagine there are all these molecules and represent them by atoms. And let us imagine that they all bump on each other. This is the modern view of a gas. It takes some stretch. The air around us looks so still. It is tempting to imagine that it is at a rest. Why replace it, as Maxwell and Boltzmann tell us, by the idea that this is made of billions of billions of tiny balls which bump on us at each moment, bump on each other in such a way that you cannot predict the evolution of their trajectories. This is a very disturbing view. But if they do so, it is because they will be able to predict some new things from this new point of view. This is James Clark Maxwell, one of the greatest physicists ever. Maxwell and Boltzmann understood, of course, that you should not try to uh, model the gas as a collection of particles and look at these particles. But instead, you should look at the probabilistic description of the gas. Just as when you do demography, you do not want to know the ages of every single person in the population. You just want to know proportions. How many percent have an age which is between 17 and 20, etc. It's the same in the statistical physics of gas. We want a distribution function that tells us which is the percentage of particles which have a certain velocity or another velocity or a certain position. And this distribution of molecules in the space of positions and velocities is the main unknown in the theory of Boltzmann, the kinetic theory of gases. This was taking place in a very important movement in sciences. The slow mastering of chance and the birth of probability theory and statistics. It starts with Jacques Bernoulli and the problem of statistics, like throwing a coin in the air and seeing if it is head or tail, and uh, finding in the end the law of large numbers, which tells you that even if you don't know which will be the individual outcome 
of one coin tossing, you know that on the whole it will be like 50%, 50% in the large. About 1730, Abraham de Moivre, who was a French Protestant, emigrated to England for religious persecution, discovered the Gaussian law. This curve, which became extremely famous, like exponential minus x square, which has the shape of a bell, it is often said, and which appears to describe the fluctuations of the mean which you observe with respect to the mean that you hope. If you toss a coin a million times, the theoretical mean would be 500,000 tails, 500,000 heads. But of course there is a deviation from this 50%, 50% perfect proportion. Is the deviation large or small? The bell curve will tell you with an extremely good approximation. And there will be a large probability of a small deviation and a small probability of a large deviation. And the more and more you throw the coin in the air, the more and more the bell will be pointed because the probability of deviation will be smaller and smaller. Let's skip this. It uh, is only around 1810 that Laplace proves this mathematically, which means by the mathematical reasoning. And he shows that it is true if you take a large number of random uncorrelated experiments, the statistical mean, that is a mean that you observe, will exhibit Gaussian fluctuations around the theoretical mean, that is the expected mean value. The width of these fluctuations will be like the inverse of the square root of the number. For instance, if you toss your coin in the air a thousand times, the typical deviation will be about 3%. Later, Ketelet made this law of random causes popular and observed that it arises not only in problems of probability and geometry as we usually think of them, but also in observations such as social sciences. Galton observed it in many, many fluctuations, for instance, in the measurements of uh, living beings. Let's say the size of some animals inside the species, and so on. And he marveled that it was always there. Let's listen to him. It's nicely written. I know of scarcely anything so apt to impress the imagination as the wonderful form of cosmic order expressed by the law of frequency of error. The law would have been personified by the Greeks and deified if they had known of it. It reigns with serenity and in complete self-effacement amidst the wildest confusion. The huger the mob and the greater the apparent anarchy, the more perfect is its sway. It is a supreme law of unreason. This is remarkably said and conveys well this idea which emerged from probability theory that if you look at a large number of unpredictable things, the statistic will obey laws which are well determined and which you cannot escape and which are hidden. Let's go back to Boltzmann. Boltzmann was inspired by all this flow of ideas from Bernoulli to Ketelet and uh, the idea of this probabilistic determinism. But Boltzmann made the enormous contribution to this story by introducing this notion of entropy, the amount of disorder that is kind of contained in a statistical distribution because we cannot predict exactly the positions and the velocities of the particles. He found a way to compute it, this entropy, with a formula that depends on the statistical distribution. Here is his formula. This 
made it accessible to quantitative uh, study. And Boltzmann proved, using logical reasoning, that for a gas which is isolated, this quantity should always increase with time, never decrease. So that spontaneously, the disorder and the uncertainty become bigger and bigger. This was a fundamental achievement, showing, by the means of uh, rational reasoning, a fundamental law of nature, which is part of our experiments, experience which is related to the idea that time passes, that things are irreversible, that we grow older, that uh, when you take a glass and uh, smash it on the floor, it will be impossible to make it again like it was before, and so on. But all this only on the model of the gas. And Boltzmann does more. With his entropy, he is able to explain the behavior of the gas. And their entropy becomes a concept which illuminates, illuminates what will happen. Take, for instance, this well-known experiment in which you take a box and put all the gas in half of the box. And there is a wall preventing the gas from, oops, from escaping. And remove the wall then we know that the gas will invade the whole box, as if it was sucked in by the void. Boltzmann tells us that there is no such thing as a sucking force. What instead is there is that the entropy wants to increase. And the entropy will be higher, the disorder will be higher, if the gas is free to wander all throughout the box, higher than if it is uh, very neatly put only in a half of the box. This is a law of nature, a law of the statistical world. A good analogy would be with young kids just after they stopped an hour of teaching. Let's say it's a recess and they are going outside and uh, maybe at the beginning they are all tidily in a corner of the area for playing, but after a few minutes they will be everywhere around. It's not that they are attracted by the void, it is because they are incontrollable, independent. This guy will go there to jump, these two guys will fight in this direction, these three others will play there, and they will, by randomness, by chance, fill the whole space because it corresponds to a more disordered state. Boltzmann was using for his demonstration, for his proof, the theory of partial differential equations, one of the major technological tools of mankind since the past few hundreds of years. These equations for today, those who are not mathematicians, you can just take them as artistic objects. Each of them, however, represents something which is concrete and part of our world. Above is the Boltzmann equation, on which I spend like uh, many years of my life, uh, and which describes the behavior of a gas inside a box, a rarefied gas. When you first see it, you don't think it is so sexy, and you don't think it is worthwhile spending so much time with. But after you discover it in depth, you see how rich it is. Door after door opening on a new universe and connected to many different problems. Below is the equation of Vlasov Poisson. The main equation, for instance, for studying the behavior of a plasma or the behavior of a galaxy. Suppose that you want to know if the, our galaxy, the Milky Way, in a couple of billion years, will uh, hit the Andromeda galaxy, as some say, you have to solve this equation, the Vlasov-Poisson equation. Here, if you prefer things that are small, not large, this might be your guy, the Schrodinger equation for one atom, the basis of quantum mechanics. 
Below is the Euler equation, which should be complemented with the incompressibility condition. The first attempt of mankind to put into equations the motion of a fluid. This looks so complicated. What are we going to do with this? Here is one of the first attempts, Euler equation. It has been perfected, this model of Euler. Below you see here the equations of Navier and Stokes, the compressible Navier-Stokes equations, which, take, which model the fluid, taking also into account its viscosity, internal friction, and the compressibility. These equations are solved every day throughout the world to predict the weather that there will be tomorrow in Europe, in Australia, in South America, anywhere. They are also solved every day in the Hollywood industry to make the special effects involving water for the latest blockbusters and so on. Every day we see results and predictions and simulations based on these equations which have become of incredible importance nowadays. And here above you see the equations of reaction and diffusion which the English mathematician Alan Turing tried to use to understand the formation of patterns on the skins of animals like the stripes of the, of the zebra or the spots of the giraffe and so on. So it is a conviction of many scientists and it has been checked on many examples that many phenomena from the real world be it, uh, belonging to the biological world or physical world, etc., can be described by these partial differential equations. Equations about certain functions. Let's go back to the Boltzmann equation, the one which Maxwell and Boltzmann introduced. Boltzmann, using this equation and his definition of entropy, showed that if a gas behaves according to the equation, then the entropy will automatically go up. This was a great discovery. It was a quantitative discovery because he could compute the amount of entropy which is produced at every time. Like how fast does the entropy increase? Well, he could give a formula at least. The formula is complicated, but it is an exact computation. He can use uh, this theory of Boltzmann to predict the behavior of the gas. You know, since the time of Newton, we have this idea that by solving differential equations, we may predict the behavior of a system after a long period of time. And Boltzmann tried to do this for the gas with this entropy idea. If the entropy wants always to increase, then it's natural to think that the final state of the gas will be the one with the highest possible entropy. Let us try to see what this will be. Which statistical distribution do you think will have the maximum entropy. We can solve this, this is a simple mathematics problem for university students, and the answer is again the same law of errors, the same bell curve shape which appeared in the works of De Moivre, uh, of uh, Galton, of Laplace, and so on. This is kind of miracle, maybe. Mathematicians love this when two objects appear or two concepts appear in two different places with no apparent relation. What is the relation between tossing a coin in the air and looking at the distribution of a gas? Apparently nothing. But in the world of concepts, they join with this Gaussian law. How fast does the gas approach this Gaussian law? This is one of the many problems that you can ask when you have solved the previous one. You know, in mathematics, whenever you solve one question, three different open problems at least occur. 
So Boltzmann showed that it approaches the Gaussian, but then immediately you can ask, how fast does it approach the Gaussian? Is it a fast relaxation, a slow relaxation? Which are the parameters uh, influencing this, and so on. In this field, an interesting conjecture by the late Carlo Cercignani was trying to give an estimate of how much the disorder increases at each step, based on some inequalities. This came to be known as the Cercignani conjecture, and this is one of the uh, first results that I, that I obtained, which I think had a good impact, together in particular with some Italian collaborator. In some sense, we solved this Cercignani conjecture, and this was part of many works that I did in those days on the themes, how fast does entropy increase? How fast does the gas become Gaussian? Some of the many problems that you can ask as a mathematician. And Boltzmann's work inspired many works of mathematicians, not just this one. Boltzmann's work inspired probabilists such as Mark Katz, who used to say that uh, the... Mark Katz, I think, was in NYU, by the way. I think he was in Courant Institute. And uh, he used to say that uh, the Boltzmann book was one of the greatest ever written in the story of exact sciences. It inspired also Einstein and Smoluchowski for their explanation of the Brownian motion, which was the key for Jean Perrin to convince everybody of the existence of atoms. And later, Claude Shannon, one of the fathers of computer science, rediscovered the Boltzmann formula as a way to measure the uncertainty that there is in a message, equating the entropy with the rate of compression that you can apply to a language without losing information, without losing meaning. One of the fundamental theories that we use all the time when we communicate electronically. It also is used by people in the industry, like in the automobile industry, where you have uh, gas flowing inside tubes and so on in motors. So the Boltzmann equation is at the same time great for theory, great for applications. The entropy also had an extraordinary destiny and was used by many mathematicians to solve problems which looked like pure mathematics. Some of them completely unrelated to physics. Entropy was used by Grigory Perelman to solve the famous Poincaré conjecture in geometry. Entropy was used in problems of uh, uh, non-commutative uh, analysis, uh, the analysis of uh, von Neumann algebras, as people say. It was used for things that had nothing to do with gas in the end, because it was a, use, a useful mathematical concept. In the examples which I discussed before, Riemann and Boltzmann, the practical applications came long after the discovery of the theoretical concepts. Maybe 100 years later, maybe 150 years later. But sometimes it is very quick. Sometimes even the theoretical concept is inspired by the application. This is the case in particular in the work of Leonid Kantorovich, one of the great mathematicians from Soviet Russia. Kantorovich worked in many subjects in mathematics, from very pure, like partly ordered spaces, to very applied, like taxi fares. He also was an expert in numeric approximation early on. But the the main work that we remember from him is his work in economics. And in fact, Kantorovich was the first mathematician to win the Nobel Prize in economics for introducing new mathematical concepts. Let us describe a little bit what Kantorovich did. First, let me say that 
the work of Kantorovich is described uh, in a very original way in the novel of Francis Perford, The Red Plenty, which examines the rise and fall of the Soviet economy from uh, all around the uh, last two-thirds of the 20th century in a way, and uh, insisting on how it can be read through the mathematical concepts of economic planification. Kantorovich and Khrushchev are two of the heroes of this story, in which the main hero, though, is an idea, an equation, or the idea of optimization. The life of Kantorovich was completely changed by plywood. Again, plywood, we won't, don't see why it would be something particularly sexy. And uh, plywood is just uh, some uh, layers of wood that you press together. However, uh, there was a story how the story of plywood came to meet that of Kantorovich. One day, people from the plywood industry came to visit him because they were looking for advice. Advice to improve their production. Because they had many parameters to choose from and many possibilities to organize their production and they wanted to know which one would be best. In plywood, you have various kinds of wood, various machines that cut the wood, that press it, various machines that process it, of course. Which one do you transport to this one? Which wood should be sent to this machine or to that machine? You have plenty of possibilities with various constraints. Like maybe this machine cannot handle more than so many, uh, such uh, many of uh, hardwood and such uh, many of uh, softwood, etc. Kantorovich did not know the answer, but he thought deep. And from that, he devised the modern theory of linear programming. The idea of solving problems in which constraints are defined by linear inequalities, like this one, and you want to optimize a linear quantity. Here the unknowns are m1 and m2, and this is a linear inequality. Often, one can do this as exercise in high school. And when you have just three equations, it's a geometric solution is easy. Now, what if you have 100 equations, or 1,000 equations, or even 100,000 equations, as this happens sometimes nowadays? For this, you need a mathematical theory to attack it by statistical ways. Kantorovich devised a uh, theory, a mathematical theory for this linear programming and understood that many problems would fall into this category, in particular the so-called Monge problem, formulated at the end of the 18th century. Imagine that you have some production sites, x1, 2, 3, 4, and that you have to transport the production to the consumption sites, like big mall or whatever, like Y1, 2, 3, 4. How do you match? Should the production from X2 be sent to Y1 or to Y2? And so on. Which will be the matching between the production and consumption sites, which will make the total transport cost minimum? This is not easy, there's no general answer, but Kantorovich understood that with his theory there are some mathematical tools to handle it. And in particular you can reduce it to a kind of problems in economics. The problem would be the following. Assume that there is somebody who is ready to do the job for you and transport the goods. So all you have to say is he will buy the goods from you at the beginning and you agree on a buying price and he will sell them back to you at the consumption sites and you agree on a selling price. You should not be cheated. So the difference of prices should not be more than the transport cost. Now what Kantorovich tells you with the theorem is that if the guy is clever 
and tries to maximize the amount of money which he will get from you, he can get as much as what you were able, that you are ready to spend for the transport. This kind of theorems looks beautiful. However, it was extremely dangerous to prove such theorems in Soviet Russia, at a time in which the idea of price was not simply an economic concept, but also an ideological and philosophical concept, with the idea that price reflects the work which has been put in it. The theorems of Kantorovich may have looked like some kind of capitalistic modeling. It was strictly forbidden to talk about them in public. And uh, it is not clear why Kantorovich escaped death. In those days, for just being too good in science and too objective, you could very well be sent to death in Russia. But Kantorovich was very useful, maybe in particular for the planning of the atomic bomb, maybe that's why he was spared, fortunately. Nowadays, the linear programming is used everywhere. Here are some examples which I took from an online tutorial. All these problems, which are very diverse, boil down to a single mathematical concept and can be solved with uh, some adequate softwares. And here we see, we understand in this example, a famous quote by Henri Poincaré. Mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. Now, we are arriving near the end of my talk. And I told you three stories, in fact, maybe it's a bit too much, the story of Riemann and his gas, and his triangle, sorry, and curvature, the story of Boltzmann and his disorder, the story of Kantorovich and its optimization problem, minimizing the cost which is spent. These are three different problems, three different theories, three different people, three different cultures, three different mathematical tools. And it came as a big surprise when it was understood around the turn of the century, so about 15 years ago, that these problems are in fact intimately related. This is an adventure in which I was part of, and this was a surprise and the start of a very active field at the interplay between statistical physics and geometry. To talk about it, let me insist that it was not discovered by thinking, but rather by randomness and by the chance of encounters. Chance plays a crucial role in scientific discovery. It is often not predictable. For some people, Science would be something like this. Uh, might be I wonder, there is a question, I accept a challenge, read the documentation and do the work and then get a prize. But everybody who has done research knows it rather looks like this. This is a picture which I stole from some cool blog on science and look at this. Challenge accepted, read, find out someone already did this, ah, instrument breaks do against science, not quite going as expected, amazing results, turn out to be crap, uh, and then start again and so on. Are you kidding me? What the hell is going on? Thinking, oh, that's funny. Oh, this makes sense. Wait, it doesn't. Thinking, thinking again, that's funny. Oh, this makes sense. Ah, they figured this out 50 years ago. <laughs> it's Kind of a tricky process. Chaotic, right? Sometimes you still end up with something. However, this is only one part of the story because it is viewed from the point of view of one individual. In our days, people collaborate more and more. So you have to imagine this picture, but then intertwine with many other 
similar stories and from these interactions, sometimes something comes out that nobody expected. For me, in this field, the two major encounters were those of Felix Otto in 99, and I went to visit him in Santa Barbara at some point, and uh, John Lott in Berkeley in 2004. Here we see the beautiful Berkeley campus with the famously ugly mathematics building there standing. And this is where I was in 2004. Not so happy about the building because not only it is ugly, but it is badly designed so that you don't meet the people there. And there are all these great people that you would like to talk to, but you don't meet them. And uh, fortunately, at that time came John Lott, who was visiting by accident at the same time the Mathematical Research Institute just nearby. And he had read my papers with Felix and some works related uh, uh, entropy and statistical physics and uh, geometry. And he said we shall use this to tackle some problems in Riemannian geometry and in particular Ricci curvature in a synthetic way. I knew hardly anything about it. It was a turn in my career when I started to go seriously into uh, Riemannian geometry while I was trained as an analyst. And the program was extremely successful. I will show you a thought experiment summarizing the link between the three stories, a link which we were able to exploit to make a new theory. It is like an unorthodox view on curvature. And it grew up from my work with Felix Otto, but also from the works of other scientists from Canada, like McCann, Germany, this is Schmuckenschläger, France, Cordero, uh, Sturm, uh, Germany. Uh, sometimes the resulting theory is called the lot sturm villani theory nowadays. It corresponds to a problem of gas. How would you explain curvature in the words of Boltzmann? How you would explain curvature in general? There is a good model for this based on the analogy with light propagation. And uh, if you want to know if the curvature in the space in which we live is positive, what you do is see how the deflection of light rays affects our perception of a light source. And if that light source is perceived as larger than it is really, it means that the curvature is positive. This is a classical interpretation. But now if you want another interpretation, one that you could give to Boltzmann if he was to come back from the grave that we saw, what would you say? Here is what you could say following our works. Take a gas made of a statistical collection of many, many atoms and impose that this gas go from a certain state at time zero to another state after one minute. Impose. Final condition with a certain distribution of density is imposed. And then the gas will obey and during this one minute all its particles will move. In which way? Well, the gas is okay to obey, but he's lazy. So he will do this in a way that he will, it will cost it the least possible amount of energy. And all along this process, you measure the disorder of the gas. If the curve as a function of time is always concave, it means you are in a positive geometry, positive curvature geometry. Look how everything fits together. Because you are considering curves that minimize the energy, the distance, well, the length. And because you are in positive curvature, the curves get closer from each other than they should. But because the final position is prescribed, 
in between they will be further apart from each other. It's like you remember the picture on the sphere with the two uh, geodesics that would separate and then meet together again. Here it resembles this a bit. So in between they will be separated and so the gas is able to spread. But if the gas spread, this corresponds to a higher disorder, as in the experiment in which the gas was uh, let loose from the half of the box and invading the hole. So in between, the entropy will be kind of higher than what it is at start or in the end. And in this way, the three stories are woven together, minimizing the cost, minimizing the energy, like for Kantorovich, looking at the separation of geodesics, like in Riemann, and looking at the disorder, like Boltzmann. This is well, the kind of thing that we like, these kind of connections. It uh, was the basis for a big reference book which I wrote in 2008, Optimal Transport, Old and New, and which got very recently a prize for best monography by the American Mathematics Society. And all this came from the random encounter of various mathematicians interested in various things. This importance of the idea that the meeting of ideas corresponds to the meeting of men, meeting meaning also meaning of men, mean, meeting of women, meeting of researchers. That is the complete significance of the title I gave. The Institut Henri Poincaré, in fact, which I have the honor to direct since 2009, is devoted precisely to this, fostering encounters between researchers. Hundreds of researchers every year visit this institute to work together on various problems in the hope, in the knowledge that new ideas will come out someday or the other from this mixing of people and thus mixing of theories. There it is at the end. Thank you very much. Um, for many of the equations, you provided real world applications. But then when you reached the last one that you had worked on, um, was it just pure fun? to do that, or do you see some real applications for the last thing ah. that you showed us over there also? <laughs> or can mathematics be just for the sheer fun of <laughs> solving those problems? For the moment, this is sheer fun, yes. I don't see any applications. However, it is uh, related to the better understanding of curvature, and curvature is a fundamental object, also in applications. So maybe there is some application to this point of view that is waiting to be discovered. There were applications in the pure world, so to speak. I mean, some conjectures in geometry, just expressed in terms of geometry, were solved through this point of view, uh, with a statistical surprising proof. Uh, to what extent, uh, for example, at IHP is or other institutions, math mathematics um, departments, is it is it like driven by application? Or is it um, you know, just driven to like explore and let the applications come later? Um, I mean, especially in, in modern times. And, um, and also, how would you prefer it? Um, it very much depends on the institution. Some institutions will prefer to be driven by applications. Some others will refuse to do that. It uh, depends on, you know, there are some institutes which are built as collaboration between the science and the industry, and which are very good at transforming uh, theory into uh, patents and into uh, applications, and some institutions which don't care. It depends on the structure of the institution, it also depends on the ambient culture, whether you are in France or in uh, United States or in uh, South Korea or in Russia, it will not be the same. IHP doesn't care of applications. IHP only sees people on a very limited amount of time. We never uh, have researchers for more than three months. Three months is the maximum duration that they can be with us. 
So it's only for small intense periods of collaboration where the ideas will come. What they do after of the ideas that they had, we don't care in the sense that we don't try to follow. It would be a massive effort to follow what these hundreds and hundreds of people do later over the years to come. And it would be a waste of time and money to do this uh, follow-up work. So we just uh, are based on the assumption first that whenever there is good progress in mathematics in a whole, there will be some progress in the applications, maybe with some delay. And also that we compare ourselves to other mathematics institutions in the world and there is some kind of benchmark that we are using using the reputation, using the, uh, evaluating the quality of the application that we have, and so on. And in the themes of the concentration periods, we try to cover a wide range of mathematical subjects, mathematics and theoretical sciences, and also to cover a large range from very pure to very applied, let's say. Regarding the destruction of predictability, um, are there some patterns which are more durable and persistent in a world that is of increasing disorder? Do some patterns tend to persist more and uh, more, more successful and more durable than others? Are you thinking of uh, uh, patterns in the physics world or in the, for instance, uh, social world? Both. I think these are uh, very different problems. In the um, physics world, this is uh, a tricky question to know which are the structures which persist, even though there is a constant increase of disorder, as the Boltzmann theory tells us. First, on our scale, the fact that there is, for instance, the sun constantly giving us some energy and some, uh, uh, in a way, uh, low entropy uh, is, uh, is something that uh, helps the renewal, the concept preservation of some structures. Which structures? There are many of them, but the most striking, of course, because it, cons it is deals with us, is the preservation and the, 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 yes, the perseverance of life. Life is, by definition, some ordered structure. The fact that there is a renewal, the new birth of an individual, which is identical or in the same kind of state as his parents were years and years before, is a process of renewal of states of low entropy, of states of order. And this structure in itself persists. It is not in contradiction with the law of increase of the entropy because it may be that some low entropy states are kept while in other parts high entropy is achieved. And this is the case with life, contributing also to the increase of entropy. But the real miracle is that low entropy persists through this life process and there is a remnant of a structure. We are extremely structured beings. Now, when it comes to uh, the other part, like uh, social, social, uh, social world, as I said, uh, mathematics applies very poorly to the ambient world. However, there are some things which are surprisingly stable in human history, in particular those related to behavior and culture. You know that vision of the structure of, the, of a government, for instance, and the relations between people are things that can go on for centuries and centuries and be persistent even through revolutions or so on. A lot of the, I mean, a lot of the way that France, for instance, sees the organization of a government and its politics is something that goes back to way before the French Revolution and so on. And similarly for most countries, you can trace behaviors and uh, behaviors and culture can go through changes of regimes often, not always, but often. 
So there are persistence of cultural traits and uh, relations between people uh, in a very strong way, much on much larger time scales than the lifetime scale of people. This, I think, is one of the most striking evolutions of the world that we have nowadays. Technology changes much, much faster than behavior of people. Behavior and uh, creed, what we believe, is uh, much slower. It is paradoxical in a way, because you may think changing one's mind is instantaneous while making a machine takes time. But in practice, it takes much more time to change the mind of people than to make a new device. So I think we've run out of time, but, but thank you very, very much, uh, Cédric Villani. Thank you, thank you.